Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here today to the Spring 2020 Honors Lecture Series on Climate Change. I'm also pleased to recognize two of our academic deans who are with us, uh, Dr. John Vile, who is Dean of the Honors College, and Dean Bud Fisher, Dean of Basic and Applied Sciences. So our speaker today is Ennio Piano, who is an assistant professor of economics in the Jones College of Business, a faculty affiliate of the Political Economy Research Institute, and a resident faculty of the Honors College. And his office is located up on the second floor. Dr. Piano studied history and political science before earning his PhD in economics at George Mason University. His research focuses on the organization of incentives in a variety of historical contexts, from the 19th century European armies to American motorcycle gangs and high-end restaurants. Uh, his topic today is Some Economics of Climate Change. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Piano. Well, let me start by thanking Dr. Phillips for inviting me to uh, participate to the uh, lecture series here at the University College on Climate Change. And I want to start with uh, a little bit of humility at the beginning of the presentation. I am an economist. I am not a climate scientist. Uh, these are two implications. Uh, first of all is that uh, not being a scientist, a climate scientist, I will be taking uh, all that uh, established science on climate change as given. So I won't be questioning any, any of that. Uh, also, I'm an economist, but I don't do research necessarily on the topic of climate change. I've done research on issues related to climate change, at least tangentially, specifically on the political economy of policy, of energy policy. Uh, but again, climate change is not a focus of my own research. So for the economics as well, I will, I will be relying a lot on the work of other economists that do actually focus on those topics, and one of them specifically uh, even won the Nobel Prize uh, for the work on the topic. So very briefly, for those of you who haven't taken economics or who are not taking economics with me this semester, uh, economics is a science of, science of trade-offs. It is a science that, that tries to identify trade-offs in the kind of choices individuals, groups, policymakers have to face. And once they have identified these trade-offs, they try to apply economic theory to predict and explain social phenomena. Uh, in the process, they've developed all sorts of very sophisticated techniques, theoretical techniques, empirical techniques, to try to identify causal relationships between social variables. Um, given the nature of the topic, let me define a couple of terms. And the first one is climate. Again, climate can be defined as the distribution of weather events. So we're talking about precipitation, temperature, uh, ice coverage, and so forth. And the reason why we need to list all of these variables is that the climate is a very complex system. Now, fortunately, there is a pretty high correlation between all of these variables and one, just one measure, which is global mean surface temperature. So pretty much if you know the direction of change of this variable of global mean surface temperature, you will be able to predict more or less what the direction of change is for climate as a whole. And now, <clears throat> I, I also feel like I, I need to talk a little bit about the carbon uh, side of things. Uh, carbon is, of course, like a common element, base of human life, uh, base of all of life, actually. Uh, and it, carbon has like two interesting properties. It is actually a very small percentage of the Earth's atmosphere, but it plays a very large role in determining uh, the Earth's temperature. And it does so through its effect on uh, the effect called the greenhouse effect. Uh, again, not, not a natural scientist, but basically, as far as I understand it, uh, the greenhouse effect uh, describes the fact that there are particles in the atmosphere, uh, so methane, carbon dioxide, water vapors, that reduce the percentage of uh, heat 
that is released away from the atmosphere. And so it captures some of this heat into the Earth's surface, into the atmosphere, and so it leads to a higher temperature. And <clears throat> this is a, um, a table that shows simulations for what uh, climate scientists predict is going to be the uh, evolution of the Earth's temperature, um, mean temperature, depending on how much quantity of CO2 is expected to be present in the atmosphere over the next 80 years. Well, of course, like this data goes back to the, to the year 2000. And as you can see, the more uh, carbon temperature we expect, to be, we expect to be releasing in the atmosphere, the higher the expected temperature is going to be in the year 2100. So <clears throat> the reason why economics has anything to say whatsoever about the origins of climate change is that climate change is partly a result of the decision of human beings to produce heat by combining oxygen and carbon. So there is this very valuable commodity that we want to produce, which is heating. And this heating can be transported into power, which is then used to power all sorts of things from our cars uh, to uh, electronics, uh, and especially in industrial uses. Basically, everything that is produced is produced, or like a large percentage of all of the output of industrial output is the result of burning carbon, combining carbon and oxygen. The problem is that this process has a side effect, and the side effect is the production of carbon dioxide. And <clears throat> we don't value either positively or negatively carbon dioxide directly. So when, when we try to produce heating, we don't really mind the fact that we're also producing carbon dioxide. The problem is that the carbon dioxide has a negative effect, a global negative effect, through the greenhouse effect. And economists call the fact that there is a, the production of a good, the production of a commodity that we value. Uh, and this also results in a commodity that we do not value, or we value negatively, as a negative externality. And again, from Econ 101, uh, basically the, the fact that we have an externality is a result of the fact that me, the producer of heat, in the using of carbon, don't face the full cost of, uh, or the full consequences of my employment of carbon. So I'm going to stop using carbon, I'm going to stop consuming carbon at the point in which the private benefit is just equal to the private cost, which in this case, just to simplify, we can assume is just the price of buying, for example, coal or oil or natural gas. So I face these costs and I keep using carbon up until the value of the next unit of carbon is just as high as the price that I have to pay to use it. But because there are these other losses associated with the use of carbon, the actual optimal, from a social point of view, quantity of carbon that I should use is here, this C star. Instead, the, the quantity of carbon that I do use is C prime. So there's just too much carbon being used from a social point of view. So the, the fact that um, the production of heat generates externalities isn't special. All sorts of activities generate externalities. Externalities, positive and negative, are everywhere. Um, usually, economists recommend that if you see an externality, you tax the externality by the value of the externality, and that brings people to take the social cost of the, of the activities that are undertaking into consideration, and therefore they reduce the, 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 the supply of all of those commodities that generate externalities. Now, there's obstacles to the employment of these optimal taxes. And that's the fact that in order to uh, enforce and design an optimal tax, you have to have a certain amount of information. For example, you need to be able to measure the value of the externality. Enforcement costs are a problem. You have to be able to identify the sources of the externality. Who is that is actually producing the externality? And then the possibility of special interest, the fact that Certain industries may try to use the government to impose taxes on competing industries so that they have an advantage in the market. So because of that, we may not see optimal taxation in the real world, even though there will be the, the, first best, the first best solution to externalities. Now, why is it we focus so much, and economists have been focusing so much on climate change? 
Well, the reason is that climate stability, stability in general matters a lot because stability is fundamental to generate productive investment. You're only gonna make productive investment if you have decent expectations that you'll be able to enjoy the fruits, to enjoy the outcome of your investment. If you don't think that your investment is gonna result into something valuable, you're not gonna invest. And so the less uncertainty you have, the more, the more productive investment you see. Well, climate change may affect that. And historically, we do see that climate, climate stability has coincided with the rise of agriculture, the agricultural revolution, and the rise of human civilization. And in fact, this is a table from a book by an economist on, uh, on the economics of climate change. And you see that right about 10,000 years ago, uh, a little less than 10,000 years ago, there is an increase in the stability, not just in the temperature, but also in the stability of the average uh, surface temperature of Earth. And that coincided with the rise of human civilization. Now, these for the economic origins of climate change, but what about the consequences of carbon consumption? Well, economists and climate scientists have uh, uh, basically produced different families of models that try to combine models of the economy with models of Earth's climate to try to predict what is gonna happen to Earth. So it's basically uh, models of the climate that include also models of the, of the global economy and especially the dynamics of economic growth. Now, the two most popular families of models are the AI, IAM at MIT and the uh, Dynamic Integrated Climate and the Economy uh, model uh, from Yale. And these models differ over many margins, uh, but the fundamental um, uh, thing that they have in common is that they identify a trade-off uh, between growth rates, so by how much the economy increases its ability to produce, increases its output year by year, and then ca carbon emissions, and therefore climate change, and long-run well-being. So the more we grow now, the larger the effect is going to be on climate change, the larger the negative effect is going to be on the well-being of future generations. So if you look at these uh, integrated models of the economy and climate, and uh, you try to put them on a table and see what the expected outcomes are going to be, uh, this is basically what you see. And you see that uh, very early models actually predicted that there was going to be a, a fall in uh, uh, surface temperature. Uh, then some models are pretty optimistic. They only predict a small increase, this is by the year 2100, a small increase in uh, Earth's temperature, while most models predict an increase between 2 and 3 degrees. Okay? And some models that are even uh, more pessimistic predict an increase in 5.5 uh, to 6 degrees Celsius. And this line, this red line, tells us what a predicted outcome in terms of well-being of the future generations is going to be. And so for every blue dot, you have the temperature increase predicted and the loss in well-being predicted. This is like uh, per capita GDP predicted in the future. And the dotted lines are the range of uncertainty. Basically, we can't really predict the point, the specific point of the combination of uh, temperature and GDP, but we have a range of what we may expect will happen uh, if that change does occur. So <clears throat> why is that we want to have a model of the economy integrated into a model of climate change? Well, that's because carbon, as I said, is employed for the production of heat, and the sources uh, of this carbon are, well, there's three main sources worldwide. Uh, number one is coal, uh, the second one is oil, and the third one is natural gases. Uh, and as you see, the United States uses a little more oil than coal, but more or less, you see that the United States and, and the U.S. average uh, mostly coincide. Well, one may think that the problem with coal is that coal is the number one worldwide contributor uh, to carbon emissions. But economists want to look at emissions per dollar. 
So what is the expected damage in dollar terms of burning one dollar worth of car, uh, coal, oil, natural gas, and so forth? Well, what happens is that once you look at this measure, you find that coal is 10 times, it is one dollar worth of coal is gonna produce 10 times more emissions than a dollar worth of oil and five times more emission than a dollar worth of natural gas. Which means that once you try to uh, establish the actual social cost of burning one dollar worth of coal, that's gonna give you one dollar and 45 cents. If you look at one dollar worth of oil, that gives you one dollar and four cents. And if you look at natural gas, it's gonna be one dollar approximately and 10 cents. Which means that coal is actually, per dollar, much more disruptive when it comes to its effect on climate change than all of the other sources of carbon. So, what can we do? Well, we can do all, all sorts of things, but uh, in general, policy debates and, and uh, economic debates have focused on three families of potential responses to climate change. And the first family uh, refers to all of those practices that fall under the category of geoengineering. And basically, geoengineering uh, uh, would require changing the nature of the climate system, the global climate system, to try to compensate for the negative effects of climate change. And I'm just listing uh, a couple of the, just three of the policies that fall under the category of geoengineering. There are being discussed by economists the most. Uh, one would be injection of sulfates into the atmosphere. Another one is referred to as carbon capture and sequestration. And the third one would require us to pump ocean water onto Antarctica. Uh, will geoengineering work? Well, ge going for a geoengineering has the fact that if there were a cheap way of doing either one of these, then just one country could actually affect uh, the, the dynamics of climate change at a relatively low cost. So say the United States, could, like United States scientists found a way to inject sulfates into the atmosphere at a very low cost, the United States could do that without having to agree with all other countries to try to coordinate, coordinate policy. The problem is we actually don't know, and that's mostly because as far as I know, well, we're now at the very early process of trying to develop and think through the different uh, kind of geoengineering practices. So carbon capture and sequestration would be the best solution because it would actually, what it would do is it would literally capture carbon emissions at the point of production. So for example, at factories. And then it would transport it to some other destination where it would be stored for a very long time. And the uh, more interesting idea that I read about was uh, putting all of these carbon dioxide at the bottom of the ocean, where uh, the pressure of the water and the, um, the gravitational force from Earth would keep it there for more than a thousand years. So slowing down the process of the emission of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, it looks like though it's still uh, economically infeasible, and also people are very uh, worried about uh, uh, the, the safety uh, of the process of especially transportation and storage, very much like for nuclear power. Uh, pumping seawater on Antarctica, uh, again, technologically so far, it seems like it's pretty unfeasible, unfeasible and very expensive. Uh, and also, it might slow down the, the rise of sea levels, but it won't actually affect very much the rise in uh, global temperatures and the uh, acidification of the oceans. And then, sulfate injections look like they're the cheapest one, or would be the cheapest one, and technologically the most feasible ones. But, well, again, they have the problem that they don't solve all of the concepts, they're not just all of the consequences of climate change, and also, they may have very large negative unintended consequences, and specifically models of the climate predict that, there, that if we were to actually inject sulfates into the atmosphere, they would lead to a fall in the rate of precipitations around the world. So, none of these are really 
seemed like really good responses at the current state of technological knowledge. There's a second category of policies, um, usually referred to as mitigation policies. And usually when we talk about mitigation policies, we're the, the focus of analysis is on national governments. And that's because national governments can impose mitigation policies domestically, so on their own countries, but also national governments are the ones that will have to agree with other national governments and find international agreements and, uh, um, and coordinate policies at the global level. So as far as mitigation policies go, the most debated ones are cap and trade, which will require each country to basically say there's only so much uh, carbon dioxide that can be emitted into the atmosphere by our economy in a given year. Okay, and then it would, the government would auction off the right to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then there's carbon taxes. Basically, if you're emitting uh, carbon into the atmosphere, you have to pay a tax. And economists have calculated that the, the optimal tax would, would be in, in the range between 20 and $80. And the, the figure that I saw most recently was $40, so a tax of $40 for a metric ton of carbon. And then subsidies to green tech. And the idea will be, of course, to try to accelerate the process of the transformation of the economy towards a carbon-free economy. So rather than using a lot of carbon in the production of heat, we would use some other source of energy. Well, in theory, carbon taxes and cap and trade are equivalent. So whichever uh, countries were to decide to adopt, we should be uh, uh, indifferent. But in reality, economists uh, have thought about the fact that, well, they, there are implementation costs associated with the two, and carbon taxes seem to be preferable, uh, both because they're more flexible, they have lower informational requirements. Basically, once you say, we'll tax you per amount of carbon that you produce, then different industries can decide how much to produce. And if there is a change in the global economy, you don't have to go through the government to basically auction off more carbon uh, or the right to emit more carbon. Countries, oh, sorry, uh, companies and industries can just decide to be willing to pay more to produce more carbon. Uh, and as far as uh, um, green tech subsidies, well, they're potentially helpful, but they suffer from informational constraints. So how do you know exactly what technology, what industry is going to be the one that is going to introduce the, the best kind of technology that is going to affect the process of climate change in the long run? And also from rent seeking. Uh, so different companies may try to lobby the government and in the process use a lot of resources to try to get these funds allocated to them as opposed to other competitors. And that is a wasteful process. Uh, so in general, economists prefer to give subsidies to more generalized R&D, so research centers, universities, so that there is not a lot that these people can do, like university professors, to get a lot of money from the federal government to do research on green technologies as opposed to private companies. Now, the problem with mitigation policies is that they're not going to have a large effect on climate change unless the, most, the, the countries that contribute the most to carbon emissions in the world all agree and coordinate their domestic policies. And like we have a problem, an externality problem in the production of, of carbon emissions, we have a similar problem in the decision of domestic tax rates on carbon. So a national government uh, faces a private cost from enforcing carbon uh, taxes. Think about the case of China. China doesn't want to have carbon taxes because they want to produce a lot of stuff to grow their economy. Uh, so yes, there's going to be a, a global effect to China imposing carbon taxes, but China doesn't bear the full benefits. And so they actually want to have a, a tax rate, T prime, lower than what would be the optimal tax rate, T star. So because of that, if countries don't have incentives that are compatible with one another, it's very unlikely that, they're gonna, that, that this process mitigation is going to result in anything that is really effective. Which is why since you know, scientists and social scientists 
have been debating solutions to climate change, which is basically 30 years ago. Uh, international governments, sorry, national governments at the international level haven't really been able to coordinate any policies that have affected that process of climate change. Now, <clears throat> from this bleak scenario, the good news is that uh, coal consumption, which again, from an economic point of view, is the most disruptive source of carbon emissions, uh, is, uh, has a very interesting property. That is that each region, each country, tends to consume the coal that they themselves produce domestically. Compare this to oil. Each region consumes a lot more, in general, more oil than they produce domestically. So this is that production by region, this is that consumption by region, and the regions are in different colors. So you see that they don't necessarily coincide in their size, especially when you compare it to coal, right? So this means that if we were trying to reduce oil consumption in a place like the United States, and say, oh, this is how we're going to affect carbon emissions. We're going to limit domestic consumption of oil. The United States buys less oil from international markets. That lowers the price of oil in international markets. Other countries buy more oil. Okay, so the effect of the climate change consuming less oil isn't that significant for the productivity of the global economy, and so it doesn't affect really the production of carbon dioxide. But when it comes to carbon, a country that uses a lot of carbon deciding to stop consumption of carbon, sorry, of coal, uh, is going to affect the total consumption because they only use domestic carbon. So if they decide not to produce any domestic coal, so if they decide not to consume any more domestic coal and to produce any more domestic coal, they actually do reduce by a lot the quantity of coal that is consumed worldwide and don't affect by much the international price, the price on international markets. Finally, <clears throat> the last category of responses to climate change is adaptation. And this is one of those categories in which economists tend to deviate significantly from other scientists that have studied climate change and especially the consequences of climate change. And that's because of these um, attitude that other scientists seem to have, uh, which they refer to sometimes as frog theory. And basically, frog theory is inspired by the story of uh, a frog being in a pot of boiling water, and the temperature is increased only slowly, uh, and up to the point where the frog basically dies because now the, the water is boiling, and so you, know, you just can't survive in boiling water. And they try to use this as a comparison, uh, useful comparison uh, for what could happen to climate change. Well, yes, the, the, the effect is going to be only in the long run. Humans are not going to do anything. And so uh, there's going to be you know, gigantic losses associated with this once we suddenly realize that temperatures have gone up by, say, 3 degrees, 5 degrees, 8 degrees centigrades, OK, Celsius. Uh, well, the, the problem is that humans are not frogs in the sense that humans, especially from an economic point of view, are going to be responding to the varying circumstances, especially at the small local and even individual level. And it also appears that frog theory doesn't apply to frogs. Uh, there's this very interesting article in The Atlantic that goes through the science and uh, it shows that this was basically made up. It wasn't true at all. Like the frog is actually going to jump off of the, of the uh, pot of boiling water. <clears throat> so the good news is that even if no national and international mitigating policies are introduced, or we find some geoengineering process to solve climate change, human beings will adapt in a predictable way to the changing conditions due to climate change. Now, this doesn't mean that the future is going to look amazing. It may, but the adaptation is going to come at a cost. And these costs may be very large. So uh, let me uh, give you an example. So this is a picture from Venice uh, last fall uh, for the, the last episode of what they call Aqua Alta. So basically just the flooding of Venice. And the flooding of Venice is very bad for Venetian people because Tourists are not going to go if you have to close down all of the museums and all of the hotels and people can't walk around. And so <clears throat> climate change may affect the ability of Venice to 
basically sell itself to the global markets because of rising ocean levels. Uh, now, Venice, though, attracts so many tourists. I was looking at the numbers uh, for the last recorded year, and it says that there were 36 million nights that were purchased by tourists to spend in Venice in one year. Okay, That's number one in Italy, and uh, it is one of the top destinations in Europe and around the world. Well, that is a lot of money in terms of, remini of revenues that are transferred from tourists from everywhere in the world to Venice. And so Venice is actually going to have a very decent incentive to try to find local solutions to the change changing circumstances. And in fact, they're already trying to figure out what to do because they don't want to have to experience this ever again. Okay? And so once you see a concentrated benefit from introducing an adaptation response to climate change, the prediction from economics is that that is the most likely form of adaptation to take place. And so because Venice can't be moved anywhere else, and there's not many Venices uh, available in the world outside of Venice itself, Venice actually has a very strong incentive to try to figure out a solution to that. Again, economists can't tell you what exactly the solution is going to be, because if we could, we would be billionaires. And instead, you know, I teach at Middle Tennessee State. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the implication for the United States? Well, in the United States, 40% of the population lives in urban metropolitan areas on either of the two coasts. Okay? So, and a, a bunch of these people basically just live New York City, around New York City, and Los Angeles and San Francisco. That's basically what's going on. Well, these cities are actually exposed, and all of these urban concentrations are very much exposed to changing climate and the rising, um, and the rising ocean levels. So, in fact, one of the regions that is the most exposed to uh, rising ocean levels is uh, the southern part of Manhattan. Should we expect the southern part of Manhattan to be abandoned by the year 2050? Well, very small. Extremely large concentrated benefits. Wall Street is right there. Okay? Extremely large investment have been made, very valuable real estate. Well, we can expect something like that, a scenario like this, to actually be one of the first ones to figure out solutions, local solutions, to, uh, to climate change through adaptation. Again, New York City, to find a solution to adaptation, doesn't have to figure out how to coordinate its policies with the rest of the world. To the extent that they can agree with, say, Jersey City, they can pretty much do whatever they need to do. It may be very expensive, and it's going to lead to, lead to disruption, but places like uh, Manhattan, places like Los Angeles and San Francisco, in the short run and the medium run, may actually gain from these rising ocean levels, ocean levels because they can afford and they have all of the incentives to try to adapt to rising ocean levels. It is the smaller urban centers on the coast that are actually going to lose the most. Not just the smallest ones, the ones that are actually not as productive. Places like Miami, places like New Orleans. They're going to be the losers, even in the short run. Now, in the long run, though, mitigated policies require high maintenance costs. And so in the long run, even places like Manhattan, even places like Los Angeles uh, and San Francisco are going to see a relocation of their population. Also, a redirection of the influx of people away from uh, these places because the cost of living there are just going go, huh, uh, uh, to go up to other cities. And so an economist at Johns Hopkins University had figured out a list of winners and losers from climate change. Uh, so that's a mistake. That's not Montreal, but that's Houston. Uh, uh, but the losers are New York City, specifically Manhattan, uh, Los Angeles, Miami, New Orleans, and Houston. They all have in common. They're on the coast, uh, uh, and they're basically going to be exposed to uh, rising uh, rising ocean levels. And the winners are all, are the largest cities that are on a large lake in the United States. So places like Buffalo, Detroit, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, and Salt Lake City. Why? Well, because 
They're going to be the least affected by increasing temperatures because they have temperate climates. But they're not going to experience rising ocean levels because they're on lakes, not on the ocean. And so he expects that they are going to be the winners in the long run of climate change, at least within the United States. The same reasoning applies to demographic trends across countries. Okay, so just to give you a brief example, rising temperatures now to be able to work in factories, but also to just stay at home, you're gonna have to, you're gonna need more air conditioning. Air conditioning is expensive, especially poor countries, they cannot afford air conditioning. Increasing temperatures means more demand for air conditioning. People are gonna have an incentive to try to move to countries where their productivity of labor is highest so that they can afford these, what is gonna become an even more needed service. And so if you look at the countries that are the most exposed to increases in temperature, uh, I looked at the top 20 countries. Fortunately, they're not very large countries. The largest country is Ghana with 30 million people. Uh, but they tend to be very relatively poor countries. We can expect the country that a population from these countries is going to be pushed to moving into very high productivity economies where their labor is more productive. They're going to be able to command higher wages and they're going to be able to afford better services that mitigate climate change in their personal lives. <clears throat> the same is true for rising oceans. Again, I looked at, in this case, at the top 10 countries that are at risk. And the population of these countries combined is 180 million. So it's not a gigantic number. It's still a pretty significant number. Uh, but basically, most of these people are just from one country, which is Bangladesh. And once again, uh, with the exception of the Netherlands and a, a handful of Gulf countries, they're poor countries. And so once again, you'll see the same kind of dynamics. These people are going to, if you have to move because your village is not going to be able to uh, survive with the, uh, with the, you know, the changes in climate, you're going to move to the most, the most productive countries, or the countries that have more resources to try to adapt to climate change. Uh, this is the final slide before the conclusion. Um, there's a, another you know, positive uh, to, to this, and the fact that uh, demands tend to be more elastic in the long run than in the short run. So even though we, were, we, we won't be able to coordinate uh, taxes on coal or try to make coal consumption legal, well, even small changes in the price that companies face in the consumption of coal may actually have large effects in the long run because even small increases in the price of coal in the long run are going to push people to, to build new factories where the, the energy source that they use in these factories is not going to be coal, it's going to be natural gas, or it could be wind, and so forth. So to conclude, again, the dismal science is going to uh, say dismal things. Um, so it, it, it looks like uh, uh, economics has very uh, unflattering things to say about global attempts to try to tackle climate change. So global scale solutions uh, are unlikely to be sustainable because people just face very high incentives to try to deviate, including cheating, right? Not revealing how much carbon they're, they're releasing into the atmosphere. The good news is, is adaptation is going to lead to a reduction in the realized losses from climate change. Uh, so yes, it's not going to be awesome, but it, it also is unlikely to be an apocalyptic level uh, scenario. Bad news, the losses may be very large. If you see millions, hundreds of millions of people relocating over, over short periods of time, that could come with disruption. We're not taking into consideration political changes. We're not going to take into consideration uh, what's going to happen once these processes uh, are in place. Uh, the good news is that I may be wrong, again, because this is not the, the kind of research that I do, and I'm hopeful that I'm wrong. Uh, but anyways, I'll let you ask questions and make any comments that you may want to, to make. Thank you.
do have time for questions, so please feel free. Uh, so the cap and trade, wouldn't that just encourage companies to move their factories overseas, so kind of like <coughs> with a smoke screen? Well, so uh, that's why these kind of mitigation policies require some decent degree of international coordination. Otherwise, yes, countries may not introduce cap and trade in the first place because they are going to think that companies are going to relocate, or they may just decide not to increase the size of their factories or hire more people domestically. Like You don't necessarily have to see a fall in you know, domestic workers employed in your industries, but people may just decide to hire more in other countries or build more in other countries. So yes. It might be helpful if you could explain the moral hazard associated with geoengineering. Yes, so another aspect, uh, thank you for the question, by the way. Another aspect of geoengineering that uh, economists and other scientists have been very fearful about is the fact that once you say, look, we have a solution for climate change, we're just going to inject a bunch of sulfates into the atmosphere, and we can reduce the temperature by basically how much we want. We just inject more sulfates. That's going to lead uh, companies and individual countries to just decide that they can uh, produce as much carbon emissions as they want, because that's going to have no effect, a very small effect on the global temperature. Well, there's two problems with that. Number one is that at some point, we may not be able to inject more sulfates into the atmosphere. And also, injecting sulfates into the atmosphere is going to have very large negative consequences. As I said, one that has been predicted by the models is that there's going to be a fall in uh, uh, rainfall rates. So yes, geoengineering could also lead to a higher production of carbon emissions, so lead to other effects that we, so for example, that could lead to a higher level of ocean uh, acidification, which is itself very bad, right? So geoengineering not optimal. And this was mentioned on the Paris Climate uh, Accord, but with countries that are trying to rapidly develop, like India, for example, they're going to be producing much more carbon just due to the industrial state mm -hmm. that their state is in. And so <coughs> I was just wondering if you think it would be kind of like feasible um, in this current day and age to uh, industrialize without the, um, I guess, the baggage of too much carbon. There will probably be carbon in general, but maybe like um, more, more green industries, I guess, um, versus the coal industries. Would it be possible? So... That's a, that's a tough question. So let's think about the kind of conditions that you would have to have to have industrialization with, say, green tech or greener energy. Well, again, we need to have uh, incentives for companies to adopt uh, those, those kind of technologies. You, have re you, you need research centers and R&D that goes in the direction of developing that kind of technology. If you need that, you, you're going to have, you, you're going to need a well-functioning national government. And so the countries that are the least developed are also the ones that have the least effective governments. So we, and, and also these policies have to be implemented and enforced. And those are the countries that have the, 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 uh, the biggest problem with implementation and enforcement of their domestic legislation. So... I'm skeptical that that, is, that that is plausible. Again, plus, if they have a lot of coal domestically, coal extraction is so cheap that coal is just so, especially if you just want to create a lot of output and try to attract a lot of foreign investment, coal just is so attractive to these domestic economies. The government just has an incentive to try to industrialize very fast. So you mentioned that one of the best ways that we can um, reduce our footprint is by reducing our coal production, production and consumption <coughs> nationally. Yes. How do you think that we should go about convincing like, big companies who are profiting off of this to move that way? OK, so let me go back to literally slide one. One second. I'm of the school of... Um, Let's see, of uh, economists that actually doesn't think that economists are great at, 
at telling governments or companies what they should do. Uh, so I, I don't feel comfortable uh, answering that question. Like the reality is that I don't know. How do you get people to behave according to their self-interest? Asking that to an economist <laughs> is hard. Uh, or at least it's hard for an economist to answer that question. Because say that uh, my answer were, well, we just get governments to uh, impose you know, large fines of industries that you know, don't follow suit. Or like you just increase taxes. There are um, taxes on the kind of acti activities that generate carbon emissions. Well, then you have to get a government that also doesn't behave in the short-term interests of the people that are inside of the government. And that is you know, problematic as well. Because why is that the government is not being bought by the companies that they get a lot to gain from uh, you know, emitting carbon? So it's a tough question. <laughs> yes? Do any of your models take into account the fact that the global population is 8 billion or so, so will be 12 billion? <clears throat> these models do take uh, population growth. Again, I'm not an expert on the topic, but do these two specific families of models do take population growth into, into consideration. So more economic growth leads to more population growth. They basically take the uh, current trend and they project these trends into the future. And they say, OK, for this kind of population, what is going to be GDP? To produce that GDP at the current technological knowledge, how much carbon do you need to emit? And that is uh, incorporated into the result when it comes to the uh, expected temperature that you're going to have into the future. So there's a conspicuously missing solution on the mitigation page, and that's the one you just mentioned, which is regulation. Like, so straight planning control regulation? Or I was wondering if you could explain why economists prefer market mechanisms uh, because economists believe that, that the price mechanism serves a role in the allocation of scarce resources. So again, in general, as a first approximation, the best solution to all sorts of activities that generate externalities is to tax the externality. You, know, you identify the externality. Again, I'm assuming that this is simple to do, which it isn't. But you identify the externality. You measure the externality. You say, whenever you produce this amount of you know, externality generating output, you have to pay these matching taxes. Regulation have, you know, other problems in terms of what is going to happen to the degree of competitiveness in the economy. You know, is regulating a, can, a, a given industry going to lower access to the industry? That's going to generate rents. So there's going to be the incentive for people to try to, gener to create regulations that actually just are capture, regulatory capture, where the industry wants the regulation to be put on so that they don't face an, uh, as much entry. You know, think about, I don't know, say that each company is going to have to hire somebody that is going to have to keep track of how much carbon emissions they produce. Right? So going back uh, in the, the, during the, uh, anyways, during the 1920s, uh, companies that produce alcohol had to basically pay and uh, house the people working for the government who were basically keeping track of how much alcohol they were producing, keeping track of like who they were selling alcohol to, and so on and so forth, including ta for tax purposes. That you're going to have to be able to pay and house more employees uh, if you have this kind of regulation. So maybe a new competitor that is just producing alcohol in-house is not going to be able to compete against you. So you may want to have that kind of regulation. Every kind of regulation that increases the cost of people entering into the market is going to lead to less competition in that market. So economists tend to be skeptical of that. I was wondering about the cost of, like, I guess you would call it privatized carbon capture versus the carbon tax. Like, if you're a big company and you pay to build these giant vats or underground chambers to hold carbon in, uh -huh. um, is it going to be where the carbon tax is? Is it cheaper to build those, or is it cheaper <coughs> to pay the tax and just emit carbon? Well, at the current level of technological knowledge, that seems that that doesn't seem to be the case. Because if it were the case that companies would have a incentive to try to build these machinery for themselves, they would be doing that, and they would be putting much more resources into researching that kind of solution. 
And as far as I know, that isn't, that isn't the case. So. Have any economists suggested reducing uh, uh, military expenditures and activities like military airplanes, ships, bombs exploded, that sort of thing? I would presume those activities would generate a tremendous amount. Not that I know of. I, I don't think so. It, I, I don't even know if they have, if anybody has estimated what the value of carbon emissions from military operations is. That would be interesting, though. One more question. Oh. Um, isn't what uh, the, the point that he just made a good argument against allowing the market to uh, be the primary force that is responsible for making these adaptations? Because he was saying that, you know, why not just pay the tax? Um, and then he went on to say that it seems like mechanically, based on what companies are doing behaviorally, that that is, in fact, what is preferable for them, that it is just better to pay the tax, which would mean that our, our you know, efforts to reduce that carbon emission have, have failed because they're essentially just shouldering the, the tax. Uh, so are you saying, I'm not sure I understand the question. So isn't, the argue, or isn't the idea that they just choose to pay the tax regardless instead of like doing the thing that would make them not have to pay the tax <coughs> indicative of the fact that the tax is failing to actually stop them from reducing their carbon. Right, so I see. In, in contrast to like if you actually just require them to stop, right, regulatory. Uh, right, so again, the, the, the assumption is that the social optimum isn't zero carbon emissions. So you would still want them to produce some output sure. that results in the production of, of uh, so what you're saying is basically a cap and trade. You're saying there's these much emissions that you can produce, and that's it. And people can exchange amongst themselves, industries and companies can exchange amongst themselves the right to produce that carbon. As I said, theoretically, those two solutions are equivalent because they should result in the same amount of carbon being released. Uh, the problem is that international markets experience shocks all the time. And carbon, uh, like cap and trade, requires the government to operate effectively in adjusting the quantity of carbon that can be produced, you know, year by year or even month by month. And that could be very disruptive. Instead, the tax allows, you, allows the market more flexibility in adjusting to these. Uh, again, this is assuming that, like, that the social cost of carbon is, the marginal social cost of carbon is constant at $40. Well, in that case, if you just let the market adjust, they can produce more carbon, but they're paying the tax, which means that under these circumstances, they should produce more and they should emit more carbon. Yes. But aren't we exceptionally certain that that is not the situation that we want to be in? Uh, in, uh, in what sense? In, in, in the sense that we're, we're very quickly, I, correct me wrong, but we're very quickly reaching the point where we don't really have the option to say, yeah, you guys can produce some carbon if that's more optimal. We <coughs> hit the point where you know, existence and, and that kind of thing is, is on the line. Right? Um, so I'm assuming so that the starting point of this scenario is we have an optimal tax, so we have actually reduced carbon emissions to the point where it is optim that that's the optimal quantity, right? In that scenario, the optimal quantity may change with market conditions, right? So for example, say that, uh, I don't know, a country goes into a very bad recession, right? And so, or a country is bombed and all of their productive uh, technology is useless. Now, other countries have to increase their productivity so that it can supply to this country that can't produce anything anymore, right? So in that case, you need to produce more carbon. In, you know, the taxes would allow for that to change. Can, yes. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand what he's saying. And, and I think what happens is you get into the situation of it's going to cost a company $10 million to put in a new piece of equipment, but $50,000 in tax. And they're going to have a tax cost benefit that they're going to look at and say it's cheaper. Right. So I think you're going to get into some of that, that when you do the, the cap and, and tax, or if you do a carbon tax, mm. there are going to be trade-offs uh, in terms of what it's going to cost the business to make those conversions versus what you are doing. You're going to have to tax them high enough 
that the tax is greater than the actual cost in order for it to be effective would be my way of thinking. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. I, I understand. I understand. So the, the reason the tax that we're thinking as if it existed would be the tax that is the optimal tax. So it's a tax at which we're perfectly happy when it comes to expecting negative, negative effects from climate change. It is actually, that's where we would like to be. So if there were a technology that would cost more than having the company just pay the tax, then it would be bad for everybody, bad for the economy, bad for society to actually introduce that, that, that technology, to, to spend all of that money in that technology, if that makes sense. Like we could spend all of the wealth that we have in the world right now to try to generate a technology that reduces carbon emissions. We're not doing it because that would be incredibly disruptive. That would reduce everybody's ability to consume to very little. It would be worse than, a, than the Great Depression. Right, on that note. <laughs>